It's an amazing thing to partner with God, to partner with God in what we think or see or feel God is doing. But it takes listening to God to do that. One of the things that Todd shared uh, last week was this announcement about a group, our program called Alpha. It's another community that kind of was a plant of its own. This time it wasn't a plant of a church, but kind of a program. A program that asks the questions, why am I here? Do I have a purpose? What's the meaning of life? Does God exist? Is this it? Uh, this is something that we're starting at ECV. We actually started it last week. It's still an open invitation for people. Uh, this is, uh, of course, it's all about exploring what it means to follow Jesus and even exploring Christianity in a non-judgmental space, a non-confessional space, meaning you don't have to believe anything, uh, whatever you believe, it's okay, and a space where there's open discussion and even an expectation for some disagreement. Um, it's kind of an amazing uh, space because you don't really see spaces like this anymore. Saying, hey, we're going to explain this, and Alpha does this from their perspective, a Christian perspective, and then says, but anything you want to bring to the table, let's discuss. Uh, let's have conversation. So last week we started it. It was an amazing, amazing thing. And one thing I realized is Alpha makes some cool assumptions about what some people who might not know God uh, might be okay thinking through, maybe even excited to think through. One of them was this question that was an icebreaker question. Usually it's like, what color, you know, ice cream or what kind of ice cream? This is a little different icebreaker. If it turned out there was a God after all, and you could ask God one question, what would it be? Ooh, bold, Alpha, courageous, exciting. But when we think about it, like, people maybe have some thoughts about this question. Like, if there was a God, not saying there is, but if there was, you know, what's a question you would want to ask that God? What's something you'd want to know? And what's funny is, even in this imaginative exercise that Alpha's kind of imagining someone uh, taking part in that might not know God, it assumes that God speaks or talks or is willing to talk back. And we could say it's because of like Alpha's like maybe intense wisdom about like theological anthropology, how we're made, maybe like some documents we have from like the ancient church, maybe it's from like the wisdom of church teachers everywhere, or perhaps it's just pop culture. The fact that when we imagine and envision God, God's often speaking, and often black according to this, but hey, that's you know, a different sermon. But uh, there's a lot of uh, ways in pop culture we imagine a God. Not even necessarily a God of Christianity, but just like if there was God, and God's always talking, communicating, sharing the heart of God to someone else, or maybe in the case of you know, Morgan Freeman sharing like a silly joke to Jim Carrey or something like that. But there's talking, and that's an assumption. Sometimes it seems like the problem with hearing from God or thinking that God speaks isn't so much in the world, because we think about a lot of religions kind of have a talking God, or even uh, kind of people that might not believe, because, well, if I did believe, I definitely would want to talk to God, because this whole thing is crazy, of course. Um, but it's actually the church, oftentimes, and even religion, that makes this kind of hearing from God thing very, very weird. I think about my wife, Tina, and some of the experiences that she's had in church. Uh, she grew up in a Spanish Pentecostal church, and it was very, very um, uh, loud in a lot of ways, but also one of the things that was really true about her experience was there were people called prophets, and they're the ones that heard from God. They're the ones that had God's word for the people. They're the ones that could say what was going on. Just what Tina shared with me about her own experience of this one church. And if you wanted to kind of say what God was about, mm, not so much. And there were some consequences involved. Tina's told me, it's like, you went back to like Hebrew scripture. Like, this is exactly what we think God is doing now. I'm like, that's pretty convenient. That, that was just a story that she told me, right? There's, there's other traditions that talk about the will of God, what it means to discern the will of God, to know the will of God. And it's usually in scripture, usually, the, the Bible, opening up the Bible. It's, we've got to discern God's will. We've got to know what God's will is. There's other movements that talk more about hey, I don't know if it's that difficult. Can't we just pick up a newspaper, see what's going on in the world, and say, well, it's clear. God doesn't want these things happening. It's clear these like, words about justice that need to be our words today. And it seems like the church itself is kind of split on how God talks, if God talks, who's able to hear God's voice, and what they do with that in a way that maybe we want to go back to Morgan Freeman and whoopee after that. <laughs> you know, well, the church really gets this complicated. Uh, Morgan Freeman speaking to us maybe is a little bit more comfortable for us. But either way, this whole topic of God speaking to us is one that we're going to delve deeper in at ECV in this next series. If we're honest, though, this isn't just the only voice we have to talk about, because there's other voices at play. And I'm not just talking about legitimate uh, 
uh, voices that people have for mental health conditions, but voices I think we would rather not hear. Voices of shame that tell us that we are wrong, that we are bad. Voices of guilt that happen after we have done wrong things or people say we've done wrong things. Voices of shoulds, that we should be doing this, we should be doing that. We should be oriented in this way, in that way, to-do lists that are just literally speaking to us. Right? If I knew when I wrote that down that it would just kind of talk back to me, I wouldn't have wrote anything down. But that's what we experience. Even dark thoughts that we battle back, but the trace of them remains. We can wonder about the voice of God, but I wonder if one of the questions we could have is, does God do anything about those other voices? Does God's speech mean anything for sometimes these other thoughts that are racing in our minds? These things we often struggle with, we'd love for their volume to be lowered. What if God helps us navigate those, even turning down the volume, perhaps silencing them all together? What if the voice of God is that good? Is that generous? Is that powerful? What if life is all about discerning the way through listening to the voice of God? That's what's at stake for us in the series. It's great for us to know that there is a way or to be considering is there this way of Jesus, but it's even better for that way itself to speak, to speak to us, to our lives, to our situations, to what's going on in the immediacy of our lives. We've already heard some testimonies from Adam. It seems like the Lord is in the business of speaking, even rather specifically. One of the questions we have to ask is why? And I'm convicted that one of the, the answers of that really the answer, is the Lord speaks to us because the Lord loves us. That God has the ability to speak, does speak, engages us that way because God loves us so much. Loves us so much that he wants to be the way for us to discern what he's telling us and for us to obey God, but also to know God as a relational being. Sometimes we think about this as listen and discern, obey, but the why is so important. And the why is because of love. That God speaks because of love. We can listen because of love. We can discern in communities of love. We can obey ultimately because we trust that God does love us. I want us to pray that the Holy Spirit would be here in this space, that the Holy Spirit would be speaking to us even as I speak, that the Lord would be on the move in this place. So please join me in prayer. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would be loud here in this place. And all that really means is that the obstacles and the distractions would fall away and that your voice would remain. That these other things that we struggle with or that we're tied up with, they would actually just crumble and fall somehow. And what would remain is your loving and kind voice to us. Pray this in Jesus' name. I'm going to get straight to one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible and a scripture that's going to be part of what we read today. It's from the Gospel of John, this verse, John 10.10, 10, and it says this, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I, this is Jesus, says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is Jesus' mission statement of the good life. We see these two characters here, a thief that steals and kills and destroys. But Jesus gives abundant life, not just rules, not just a little kind of get to heaven free card. It turns out it wasn't that free. Again, different sermon. Uh, not just mere religion, but Jesus comes for life. Jesus comes to, to give life. And it, it turns out this life does have something else attached to it. Someone that's trying to steal life at all cost, to kill promise, to destroy hope, to destroy the efforts that God would have to give us life. This thief, the devil, the enemy, and Jesus the one who walks and comes with life. What's the, the context of this passage? What's the context of this mission statement of the good life? It's all about Jesus speaking to us and Jesus being a shepherd and us, if we're willing to kind of humbly receive this, being sheep. Let's check out the beginning of this passage. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate but climbs in by another way is a thief and a bandit. 
The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Love this passage. Jesus speaking about hearing God's voice, and the people say, what? Huh? Come again? But I think there's something actually important to this, because it doesn't say that they didn't hear him, right? But they just don't understand. I think this actually is a first lesson for us. Sometimes for us, when we are trying to hear from God in whatever way, whether that's reading the Bible from a place of not really interacting with it, getting prayer from someone, listening to God ourselves, oftentimes when we think we perceive something, but we're confused, we say, well, God didn't say anything. God didn't speak. God doesn't speak to me. I don't think the disciples say here that Jesus didn't say anything. They just said they didn't understand. Sometimes we need to be honest that it's not that there's something said but we simply don't understand. We're simply confused. What if the Lord is speaking? What if God's saying something? But we have to piece that together. Adam's image of the sloth. Well, that's weird. That couldn't be God, right? Until it is. There's some confusing things that the Lord says all the time, but it turns out we have to lean in and ask, God, what are you saying here? But some things actually are pretty clear from the passage. There are these sheep, and they hear the voice of the shepherd, and what do they do? They follow the shepherd because they know his voice. There's a familiarity that the sheep have with the shepherd, as the shepherd every day calls them in and out. And they said that there's this gatekeeper that opens the gate. There's a thief that would want to steal. Jesus used this metaphor with them, but they didn't understand. For us, we don't understand for some other reasons. Mostly, we're not shepherds, so it's hard for us to know that this is what the sheep pen looks like. That they're being called in here to a place of refuge, to a place of safety, a place where they can be together. And they're being called to go out from there. And we might wonder, where's the gate? Josh, I don't, I don't see a gate here. See that little hole at the front? That's actually the place where a shepherd would be. The shepherd actually is the gate. This is where Jesus is not just being super creative with his language. It actually just is true. Like, that's what it looks like. You can kind of see there in this image. The shepherd just like kind of is in the cut, like lying down, literally the gate for the sheep, letting them go out or letting them go in. In this metaphor, but also in this experience, the sheep don't stay in one place. It doesn't really seem like you would need that much language for that, right? Stay, sheep. Stay. No, please stay here. I know there's walls and you can't get out, but just stay. You don't, you don't need that. But the language is for movement, for relationship. No, go out there and graze. Come back in. That's what this language that Jesus is talking about, that's the context of it. Jesus saying, I'm the good shepherd. There's more. Thankfully, Jesus is generous with the disciples and with us, and we get more of what this means. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and will go out and will find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. When we listen to the shepherd, we have the possibility for the good life, an abundant life, a life directed by the shepherd, directed by the person of Jesus, as he leads us in and out of some pretty strange and tricky places. This shepherd that would look to the situation of our lives and say, I can guide you. I can help you in your family struggles, with your money, with your relationships. I can be the one that speaks, and that speech will guide you. Jesus continues, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because the hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. 
just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Why should you follow the shepherd? Well, I don't think it's just because you're sheep, but why should you follow the shepherd? Because the shepherd will lay down his life for you. The shepherd's love looks like something. It's a sacrificial love. It's a bold love. It's a courageous love. It's a love that would give everything for the sheep. It's different than the hired hand. The hired hand is doing similar things, talking in similar ways, familiar and aware and even with the sheep in some ways. But what's different? The hired hand is working for, it seems like, different purposes. When the wolf comes, does the hired hand stay? No. It runs, it flees when there's danger versus the shepherd that would lay down his life for the sheep. A human laying down his life for an animal. Something of a different magnitude. But Jesus says, no, I want you to see that, that I'd be willing to do that for you. The good shepherd loves the hired hand simply works. It's not just that we can trust Jesus to speak to us. Apparently, we can just trust Jesus because of what he's willing to do, because of what he's done, because of what he will do. Apparently, more things are speaking to us than we can realize. These voices maybe of shame or guilt or brokenness, but also it seems like piercing through all of that is the shepherd's voice. A trusting voice, a loving voice, a guiding voice. This voice that lays down his life for us, a voice that moves in sacrificial tor service towards us, a voice of love. When we think about hearing from God, that might not be our first go-to, that the good shepherd would speak words of love to us, words of familiarity, but there's, a, again, a reason that the sheep know his voice. It's not just that he's barked orders at them, but there's been real care. And for some of us, we need to begin our journey thinking about hearing from God with wondering, are there ways that we're desiring God and God's voice to give us real care, real love, real support? When I was on my own journey of hearing from God, uh, it kind of ramped up when I came into this community of ECV when I was 22 years old. I would have said before that I was someone that maybe heard from God, but the way I would have defined that is I heard from God occasionally, like when things were like really bad maybe, or when like something really spectacular happened, like, whoa, like I feel like I just got something from God. Like it would have been a surprise. It wasn't regular. It wasn't ordinary. It wasn't uh, familial even. It was like, whoa, God spoke to me. That's how I would have kind of described my life with listening to God's voice. And all of a sudden I entered this community of ECV and it was pretty strange for me because people were acting like you could just hear from God, like just listen to God. I'm like, wait, like he's going to talk like I'm talking? Like that's kind of crazy. They're like, no, no, not like that. Not usually. But mostly listening to God for an impression that God would speak in your heart or maybe seeing an image, like seeing an old memory, like the last time you were at the beach. You guys might be seeing an image, but you're looking straight at me. God often speaks like that. And especially when we ask him, when we ask this relational God, God, would you speak to us? And as I started my journey, there was a crucial piece of wisdom that someone else said. And they said, and also when you're trying to do this, I mean, you could ask like, God, like, why did this war start? Or God, why? It's like, you can ask these big questions, but most of the thing, time, God will just say that he loves you. That that would be like the foundation. And I was like, cool, let me like try this out. So as I started to pray, using journaling sometimes, sometimes taking walks, sometimes just sitting in prayer, I started to feel like I was hearing something. And it was these three simple words, sometimes four. I love you. I love you, Josh. I love you. And sometimes it would be like consistent. I'd be like, okay, God, like thanks. But like, so what do you have for me? Like, what are, what are you doing in my life? I love you. I love you. I love you. Cool. So I'm in this relationship with this woman named Tina. I'm kind of nervous about that. Can you give me some? I love you. I love you. I love you. Okay. So I'm in YDS, the old divinity school. Who knows what's going on there? I don't know what I'm doing. Like, I'm not sure where I'm going. Like, I love you. I love you. I love you. To the point, honestly, where it got pretty annoying. <laughs> I was like, thank you, God. I know you love me, but like, is there anything else? But then I felt God honestly keep sharing that foundational message. And part of me, to be honest, really enjoyed that. I was like, 
wait, like something might be more important than my like angst about my relationship with Tina. Something could be even more meaningful than like thinking like, where am I gonna go that I'm a Yale Divinity School student? Like who knows what happens after that? Something could be bigger, God's love. I started to become curious about why is God saying this so much? Like maybe I actually need to hear this message. And it just started soaking over me. Do you know that maybe the most foundational thing you'll hear and even as you go out this week and try to hear, the thing that you will hear that will be the most important is that God loves you. And God will say that directly. God will say that through a memory. God will say that through Scripture. And that's the foundation for everything, that God loves you. Not just generally everyone, but you. And doesn't just love you, but likes you. Like wants to spend time with you, as if that God is a loving parent. Jesus calls him a father, as if that father wants to be with you. Now, if that's how I'm going to see God, I hope God kind of says over and over again, I love you, because I'm like, it's kind of weird if you don't. You just want me to do things for you? You just want to say this over me? Do this, do that, what's wrong? No, that's not how I see God anymore, because God started with this foundational message of you're loved. Matt spoke on this, I believe, two weeks ago. But we see this in Jesus' life. Before Jesus does absolutely anything in ministry besides being born and getting lost at the temple, we see this in his baptism. A voice coming from heaven saying, You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. Later on, then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. And it turns out we're not that different than Jesus in this respect. That the Lord wants to say over us that we are beloved, that he loves us. So this is our journey of listening to God. I think it's pretty meaningful that when Jesus' ministry, this is the first thing we really see about him hearing from God. And to me, it means that every other message that Jesus received from his Father, love was baked in. Love was there. It wasn't separate. It wasn't an add-on. Things were infused with love. And as I started to wonder if this was really more of who God was, just a foundational aspect that God is love, And as a loving parent, God wants to communicate that love to us. I started to wonder, does he want me to do this with other people? Like, is this as, is it as easy as that? that, Is this like a private experience for me, or do I get to share that with other people? And we see in the scripture, back in John 10, that Jesus then says, I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice, so there will be one flock and one shepherd. So I started to share this kind of, way of listening to God with other people. And I didn't really do that based on, like, I'm going to try to find out who's a Christian, or, like, who's, like, the other people in this church, and, like, who will be okay with this, and, like, is, like, set, like, I said, I think this is for everyone, so I'm just going to try. And if I embarrass myself, like, that's okay. I was leading a home group at the time, so there were some people coming, or friends of other people, so I was just kind of saying, hey, do you want to try this experiment together? Let's read a passage about how God speaks, and let's try to listen to God during the week. And one woman who, uh, I'll just call her Kay, She uh, was really uh, kind of not used to this. Uh, She was from an Eastern background in terms of her religion, and so she was kind of saying, I don't know if I kind of get this personal God, but let me just try. And so she had a journal. uh, She wrote a lot. And so she started to ask God these questions. And then she came to me later in the week and said, I have a question for you. This is an important question. Like, I need you to answer this. I was like, "Uh uh-oh, like what came up? Did she like talk about one of those weird questions like that you're not supposed to ask God or God doesn't really give an answer to? And she was like, Josh, is God funny? (laughs) And I was like, yeah. Like, Ruth is saying yes. Like, I was like, yeah, I think so. It's like, I just, I just feel like God's like kind of just joking with me. Like, I feel like we're just like telling jokes to each other. Like, is that, is that okay? I was like, yeah, like, I think God, God loves you. He likes you. God's in a good mood. God is joyous. Yeah. She's like, that's kind of cool. So I'm feeling like there's like some familiarity here now. I feel like I like this God now. Some other people uh, shared things like this. Hey, as I've been praying, I feel like I'm remembering some things. Like, I remember that I had this childhood dream. Uh, And this dream was uh, of him uh, by a river. And it's a river from his uh, hometown back in China. So he knew exactly what the river was. There was a bridge that in real life is complete, but in this dream was separate. Like, it wasn't touching each other. And there was a rainbow that was completing the bridge, There were uh, bubbles uh, above the river that had fish in them, so fish were encased in bubbles. Uh, And then 
I think there was just a sense of like this felt good and it was also in like Technicolor. And he said, so that's a dream I had when I was, when I was eight. That probably doesn't mean anything, right, about like my life or, you know, about this God stuff. And like it took like all the leaders of the group just to be like, just like hold it, hold it. And finally one of them, Caleb Maskell, who's a co-founder here, was like, so I mean, maybe it doesn't mean anything, but it could also mean that this bridge represents like some hope and reconciliation for you and your relationship with God. Like the background of China might be because like you can really see like your ethnicity tied into who God is. It's not separate. The fish could represent like kind of this uh, call that Jesus has that we're fishers of men, like kind of represent some ways that you might share that with other people one day. And like this hope that like the rainbow bridge could like get connected is maybe this hope that like Jesus wants like a relationship with you, but maybe it doesn't mean anything though. <laughs> we're like, whoa, like that was crazy. Like, and he just remembered this dream as he was starting to think about, could God be speaking to him? In that same home group, a guy came to our home group named Bob Ekblad. Uh, he's one of the speakers at Vineyard Justice Network. And it was so interesting in that home group, he basically just prayed for every person after doing some Bible study about uh, who God is and that God's this personal God. And each person that he prayed for, something different happened. There's one person he prayed for where there were no words exchanged. But that person just felt God's presence. They kind of described it as electricity running through their body. Another person, he whispered something to her. And later on she said, that was actually like a, a familial nickname that he just kind of knew. And I knew that God like knew me or understood me. Uh, for some of the people, it was an encouragement from scripture. It was different things for different people because it turns out that God loves us. And God loves us individually. God loves us purposefully, intentionally. One of the things that uh, I think Todd and Ryan will be teaching tonight, the prayer ministry training, is we can listen to God in that way. God, what are you saying to this person? And it turns out, surprise, surprise, it's not our worst secrets. It's actually sometimes our greatest hopes, the things we need to be seen, to be healed, to be set free. Like that, that's why God speaks to us. God gets in our stuff and in our story, and we think, oh no, God's there. But then we feel seen, and we're like, wow, I'm so glad he is where he is, that he knows what he knows, that he loves me. Just a few stories. There are more. These stories aren't your stories. I don't know how you've encountered God's love, how you've listened to God's voice, but I feel like there's so much more that God wants for you. There's more than we could ever ask or imagine. What if God's voice is closer to us and better than we could have ever imagined? This is the beginning of our journey. We're going to spend several weeks listening to Scripture that talks about how God speaks to us. We're going to spend several weeks listening to stories of these different teachers and how the voice of God has impacted their lives and how God's voice doesn't show up in one way or another. But there's many different ways we can hear from God. There are many ways to kind of orient a series like this. You could say, well, God speaks through dreams and God speaks through the scripture. God speaks through uh, his still small voice. Uh, But what we're going to do more is basically share the, uh, the foundational things behind hearing from God, like love as the foundation. Also maybe a belief that God speaks specifically, not just generally, but God speaks in a way that can actually change our lives. That God speaks corporately, communally, not just to individuals, but to groups of people. And he asks them to listen to each other, sometimes across surprising lines of difference. That God speaks through his story, that the story of God is big and vast, yet God speaks through it. It's not like there's just new stories happening, but the stories are connected to what God is up to. And that God speaks in rather ordinary ways that aren't something that we have to kind of uh, make mystical, but actually it's a pretty ordinary way that God speaks. That's probably the best way for us to understand that day to day. So those are going to be the topics for the next few weeks. And there'll obviously be different ways that the scripture uh, talks about hearing from God, different stories that we'll use. But the real emphasis that we want to share is that God is a God who speaks. You know, I think about this a lot and the metaphor of family, because that's part of how God asks us to relate to each other, to one another as brothers and sisters, and to God as this loving parent. And I think about what kind of parent would not speak regularly to their kid, speak lovingly to their kid, and unfortunately there's some stories of that, even in this room, stories of pain and brokenness. But the parent that we would want, the parent that we would long for, would be a God that would communicate. Some of you guys know I have an almost two-year-old daughter, and I have a daughter on the way. And I don't want to be a father that occasionally speaks to them. That's not what I want. I want to be a father that regularly speaks words of love that are ordinary, that are powerful, that are shaping, 
but that are often. And that's the relationship that God invites us into. No matter what our theological baggage is with that, no matter what our religious background is, faith or no faith, no matter what kind of branch of Christianity we're from or maybe more have a a tendency towards, God speaks because God's a loving Father. And God wants to communicate with us, His children. Here's a few invitations for us as we close and invite the worship team to come up. This week, as a dare, as a challenge, set aside five minutes each day and ask God to experience the love of God. Just start there. Five minutes. This, I love iPhone alarms because you can just set it, timer, don't have to worry about it. Is it going off or not? Just like set it, throw your phone across the room, hopefully it will land on a pillow, and then just say, God, can I experience your love? And then eventually, you know, the chime will go off and maybe you'll be like in the ecstatic love of God. And you'll be like, Josh, I don't care about that alarm. I'm going to keep going. Or you'll be like, that was actually helpful because that was really hard. And I'm not sure if I'm going to do that tomorrow. Like either one is okay because it's starting a practice of listening to God and experiencing the love of God. If God does indeed speak, what area of your life do you want God to speak to? And are you ready for life there? So two questions. If, if God could speak, what area would you want him to speak into you? And then just kind of as a gut check, do you want some life to grow there? Because that's what God's going to do. God's going to allow life to grow, maybe in a place of stalled growth, maybe in a place of death. But he wants to bring life. And that can look like exactly what we want. And sometimes that can look like something we want to say, no, I don't, I don't want that kind of life. But God says, do you know what's good for you, though? Again, another sermon for a different day. Last invitation. Who else might be asking you to pray more to experience God's love? In God's speech. Who else might God be asking you to pray for in a different kind of way? Hey, I kind of pray for this person just for their general well-being, but specifically this week, I'm going to pray for them to experience God's love, experience God's speech. In our community, we have some surprising stories of praying for people, and then they come and say, I had this dream. Can I share that with you? Or here's a, a story that I want to tell you. Or even just like, have you been praying for me? Because can you actually just pray for me right now? Turns out when you pray for people, things change. I'm going to invite the communion servers to come up. In communion, we celebrate and recognize the love of God that's poured out for us. The last thing Jesus says in this passage is, For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I've received this command from my Father. In communion, we recognize that Jesus willingly laid down his life as the good shepherd, laying it down for us, his sheep. We acknowledge in taking the bread that his body was broken in doing that. We acknowledge in dipping into the cup, the juice, that blood was shed in doing that. And I hope through this act, we realize something, that we can trust God even in the most darkest of circumstances, because Jesus trusted God. And he trusted God with his body, his blood, to trust that there would be a better end, a better story, a better way. And through the gospel, Jesus coming close to us, we know that that way is possible, that that trust that we can have towards Jesus was well-earned and well-deserved. Through imagining and also believing And having faith, we can understand that this sacrifice wasn't just an ancient event, but was for us today. We can say, Jesus, would you speak to me about that? Would you convince my heart even more about that? Because I want to trust you. I want to believe that these words that you're a shepherd that would help me, your sheep, mean something for me. And in communion, we can take in those elements and be changed and experience our trust grow and grow and grow is that ancient event becomes connected to how we live each and every day of our lives. Holy Spirit, would you come right now in this place? Would you allow our trust of you to grow in your speech, in your love, in your goodness, in your way? Because we just want, don't want to merely believe that you exist. We want to trust that you love us and that you speak to us out of that love. Would you convince us even more in our hearts of that today? for the rest of this time. In Jesus' name, amen.